Welcome back to Applied Materials and Corrosion. This time we're looking at different types of corrosion. So our first type of corrosion that we had was if we take a piece of tin, and we throw it into some acid, very little happens because the tin can't dissolve if it can't donate its electrons to anything. A small amount of tin dissolves into the water, then the metal becomes negatively charged, and then it's too negatively charged for any more tin to be oxidized. But if it's attached to a piece of platinum, the overpotential for hydrogen formation on platinum is much lower, and so those electrons that are given out of the tin can react at the surface of the platinum to make the corrosion occur. In this case, the tin is dissolving and the hydrogen is being reduced to hydrogen. So the tin is being oxidized to tin 2 plus, the hydrogen is being reduced to hydrogen zero, and we have an electrochemical cell that is short-circuited here, so it's doing no work. In a typical example of an accident that people might do when they construct things, we could, if we take a zinc-plated screw and we put it through a piece of stainless steel, it'll hold it together. It'll hold it together really well, but it is terrible for corrosion because the zinc can dissolve out of the zinc plating here, ZN2+, plus. that gives electrons to the rest of the material, and they hang around there until they can do something. If we have a little bit of water and salt on the surface, so it rains on it, maybe it's part of your car, if it rains on it and it gets a little bit of salt on it, this part can do the other part of the reaction, the reduction part of the reaction, and then it will be typically, in this case, the formation of hydroxide from oxygen. So we have O2 coming from the air and reacting to form OH-, and that is spread over a very large area, which is a doubly bad problem. Normally, if we had a piece of zinc and it was corroding, so if we have a plate of zinc, that's corroding. As the zinc dissolves, it's getting into a solution that contains hydroxide ions that are created from the other part of the reaction, and that forms zinc hydroxide at the surface, which is a solid and blocks further reaction. If we separate the two reactions, then the zinc part becomes slightly acidic, and the hydroxide part becomes slightly basic, but if they're not close to each other, then the zinc dissolution is comparatively unhindered. It can dissolve into acidic solution, as we saw from our poor by diagrams before. If we look at a poor by diagram, zinc is unstable in acid conditions. It can dissolve straight into zinc 2 plus. It is quite stable in neutral to basic conditions really basic conditions it becomes unstable again, but neutral to basic conditions zinc is really stable. It forms an oxide layer. It's not thermodynamically stable, but it's kinetically stable because the oxide layer gets in the way. If we take a piece of zinc and we leave it in the environment, it dissolves at a rate that's measured in micrometers per year. So if we have a millimeter of zinc, it's going to take a really long time for it to go away. So if we write our types of possible corrosion, we can see that the lowest type, the not so bad type, is uniform corrosion over the whole surface of our metal because it's going to corrode comparatively slowly. Something will limit the rate. In the case of oxidation in normal conditions, it is very often the oxygen concentration that limits the reaction because oxygen has to diffuse from the air into the liquid phase, into water, and then it has to get to the surface, and then it has to be reduced to oxygen, to hydroxide. That is usually the part of the reaction that limits the rate, and so the uniform corrosion is comparatively slow. Obviously, if we provide it with lots of oxygen, if we stir it and provide transport, then it becomes more rapid. 
Galvanic corrosion is when we have two types of metal and they interact with each other, although galvanic corrosion also uh, applies to other types of corrosion too. So if we take pitting corrosion, it's the opposite of uniform corrosion. Instead of a general surface layer being attacked, local areas are. So let's have a look at that to start with. So let's have a look at that to start with. So if we imagine a pit, a small hole in a piece of metal, this is typically zinc, but it does happen on other metals. If we imagine a small pit, we can see that the concentration of oxygen at the surface and the concentration of oxygen in the pit would be the same if nothing happens in a non-active case. But as soon as the zinc starts to use up the oxygen, it will only use up the oxygen on the surface at a given rate. But the oxygen that goes down here is used up in all directions and to get down to the bottom is very difficult. So the oxygen at the bottom of this pit will get used up and oxygen diffusing in will not get there very quickly because it will be used up on the way. That means we will get a difference in concentration of oxygen between here and here, which generates a galvanic cell. So if we have a uniform corrosion, there is no reason for the electrons to go from one place to another. If we have pitting corrosion, where we have a concentration difference of oxygen in this case, then we have motivated the electrons to go from one place to another. So just like in the other example, the electrons can go from our pit into the other parts of the surface, reducing oxygen here all over the surface and making it somewhat basic. That leaves our zinc part slightly acidic because the zinc 2 plus will try to react with water to form zinc hydroxide, which will release protons, which will make this acidic. And the acidic part will push it further in this direction because it will make the zinc soluble and allow it to diffuse out, causing more zinc to dissolve, making it more likely to dissolve faster and accelerating the process. So this is a particular type of corrosion that is really bad. And it can be very bad because if we drill a few holes in our zinc, although the global rate of corrosion is only micrometers per year, if we locally drill a few holes in it, it loses its strength very quickly without very much of the zinc being lost. And so the strength of zinc can go down very quickly this way. This is promoted by chloride ions typically. Other halogen ions also do the same. And they do that by interfering with the integrity of the oxide layer. The next flavor of corrosion is crevice corrosion, or it's called crevice corrosion. So if we, instead of accidentally generating a pit, if we deliberately make a joint in between two pieces of metal or in between a piece of metal and something else where there's a thin crack, if water, particularly water, but sometimes other liquids, if particularly water penetrates, then we have generated a pit effectively, but it's an artificial pit and therefore it's called crevice corrosion. So the same thing, identically the same thing happens. So we've generated a situation where there's less oxygen inside the crevice than there is outside in dynamically because it's being used up all over, but the inflow of oxygen to this part of the surface is much lower and that allows it to become used up. And once it's used up, this crevice becomes more acidic because there's no hydroxide being formed and the dissolution of the metal usually accelerates at that point. That can, can cause terrible things to happen because this is exactly where our fastener is and we are focusing the corrosion accidentally on that point. So either the fastener will fail or the hole through the metal plate to the fastener can fail as well. Those two things will happen, but this is effectively also pitting corrosion because we're doing exactly the same thing. We're generating a diffusion cell which um, focuses the corrosion 
in this part, even though the metal is the same inside and outside. So in the fifth case, we have, I call it grains and stress, so it's either grain boundary cracking or grain boundary corrosion and stress corrosion. This is a case where, or this is two cases where parts of the metal um, become more active than other parts, electrochemically different, so that we can generate a galvanic cell by accident. In the cases of grains, it is the same as the chemical effect that you have heard of from metallurgy, where we etch different grains of metal and the grain boundaries differently using different chemicals so that we can investigate them. On the negative side, typically the grain boundaries, the eutectic between the grains is more reactive than the grain so it can be eroded more quickly and if we get it badly wrong, the grains will be performing the reduction part of the reaction and the grain boundary will be performing the dissolution part of the reaction. The metal will be dissolving in between the grains and then they will fall out. Why is stress corrosion similar? Stress corrosion is where we apply stresses to the metallic part and some of the parts of the material become focuses because they're under stress. They become focuses. It becomes easier for those to dissolve because they're under stress and that creates again a galvanic cell focusing corrosion onto one part of the material other than rather than others. Uh, stress corrosion is particularly bad because it's hard to diagnose beforehand because it generates cracks through the sample because as you can imagine if a small part of the surface is stressed and corrodes away that will shift the stress inside the material and it will tend to crack into the material and make it worse and worse and worse and then the, it will fall apart but it will be a very fine crack into the material that will form this next type of corrosion is cathodic delamination. So our metal, in this case zinc, should dissolve, but it's coated with paint. So typically this would be a car body or something. If we coat our zinc with paint, it's fine, unless there's a hole in it, in which case something bad happens. So let us think as about what could happen here. So now what can happen is water can fall onto our piece of zinc, causing the zinc to start to dissolve. It turns into zinc 2 plus, which, which polarizes our zinc. It makes it more negative. All of our zinc is now more negative and oxygen should now be reduced wherever it can reach. However, only a little bit of charge can flow because the oxygen is reduced to form hydroxy radicals and um, hydroxide. Uh, ions. This would be a hydroxy radical or a hydroxide ion and they will be deposited or they will be formed at the interface between the metal or actually the metal oxide and the paint. However, just like in a normal cell, we need to connect our cell up both electrically and also ionically and there, unless there is a path for ions to transfer, this cannot happen. So if we're very far away from what we call a defect, from this hole in our paint over here, nothing can happen. But at the interface here, and moving along, things can happen because ions can flow underneath the paint. So if we've got a little crack underneath our paint, and I've made it start here, wherever it gets to, Hydroxy radicals will be formed and hydroxide ions and they will interfere with the paint. They will start to break the bonding between the paint and the oxide and that will eventually cause it to break and gradually it will unzip further and further underneath the paint, hence delamination. So if we leave this for a long time, the paint will let go completely and we'll just be able to peel it off as a whole sheet. If we catch it quickly, we will still have a problem because ions have traveled underneath there. 
What we learn from this is that oxygen can get through paint fairly easily. It's not blocked. We don't need very much to get through, so it's limited. It can't get through very quickly, but it can get through our paint fairly easily. And that water is also penetrating to the interface here. Water, is, water and oxygen are penetrating through our paint. It takes a long time, but they penetrate through the paint and get to the interface. At that point, they can do their job. We also learn another thing. The zinc oxide is not doing very much to prevent this process. It prevents dissolution of the zinc to a certain extent, but it is not preventing this process. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so this is our three parts. First of all, we've got the zinc, which has electrons up to here, and then it's Fermi level. And just above the Fermi level, there are a few electrons floating around. That's the ones that are conducting. And just below the Fermi level, there it isn't quite full because the electrons are thermally being promoted into higher energy states because we're not at zero energy. Sorry about the lighting. If we look at the zinc oxide, it has a band gap. So down here are our electrons and all of those energies are full. And above it, there's a gap where there are no energy states. So there can't be any electrons. And above that, there are some other states where we could put electrons, but there are none. So the zinc oxide is the semiconductor. And over here is our water plus oxygen that need to react with each other to form hydroxide plus an electron, and that has some energy level up here. What happens if we start to allow it to react? The zinc dissolves, that pushes up the energy of the electrons, because it's dumping electrons into our zinc. So that pushes our Fermi level up, because we are effectively just shoving electrons in there and not doing anything else. So that's going to push our Fermi level up. The Fermi level going up is going to interact with the zinc oxide and try to donate electrons into the zinc oxide. It's going to force electrons to go into the conduction band of the zinc oxide, which will cause it to reduce. It will cause it to reduce to make zinc, zinc oxide, and then it will start to conduct. So let's see how that happens. We will first of all push this up to here. And then that will have a reducing effect. Push it up past there. We'll have a reducing effect on the zinc oxide because we have extra excess electrons that will generate some zinc uh, zero positions in our zinc oxide. Zinc one and zinc zero positions in our zinc oxide, some interstitial atoms and they will behave as conductors, which will allow the electron to hop along here and get into our oxygen to generate the hydroxy radicals, which will cause the problem. So our zinc oxide is not very good at stopping this. If this was aluminium, aluminium oxide is a lot more difficult to polarize this way because it's harder to get to the anti-bonding state to get into this non-conducting state. The band gap is bigger and these interstitials are harder to generate and so an, uh, aluminium oxide is much more protective against this type of process. If it was titanium we would also see the same effect that titanium dioxide is quite resistant to this, titanium resists being reduced. So that will do for types of corrosion for this week. There are a couple of others for completion. So if we take filiform corrosion, that's a type of corrosion that tends to happen on aluminium and it's exactly the other way around to the um, cathodic delamination in that the anode is where the reaction happens. We will cover that another time. Hydrogen embrittlement is a side effect. So if we take a metal that is reducing enough that it can create hydrogen, so in that case that we had it was tin, 
um, but in, t in the case of tin it doesn't make very much. If we take another one, magnesium for example, we throw magnesium into water, it will make hydrogen. The hydrogen can diffuse into the metal and it forms an interstitial, it becomes part of the metal, but it hangs around between the atoms and interferes with them moving. And so the magnesium goes from being a very ductile and quite elastic material to being a very brittle material. This is a very common problem. If we have reactive metals, they tend to become brittle from hydrogen going into it. Also, if we decide we're going to electrically prevent corrosion from happening, so we connect our metal up to either a magnesium electrode to make it impossible for it to dissolve thermodynamically, or we connect it to a battery that's going to keep it at a low potential. So from my poor by diagram, it's down at the place where the metal is completely immune from corrosion. We have a new problem that we start to make hydrogen at the surface and the hydrogen diffuses into the metal and it can make it go brittle. That is a definite problem. It happens a lot for biomaterials. Magnesium implants suffer from this problem that you have the magnesium in you, it starts to degrade, it starts to corrode. There isn't a huge amount of oxygen around inside the body, but there's plenty of hydrogen ions, and so we can form hydrogen. The hydrogen is not great, but it doesn't kill, it, kill you. It can dissolve in blood and get transported away, so it's not a super problem, but it does diffuse into the metal as well and changes its strength and other properties which can be a serious problem because then it will fail in ways that we were hoping it wouldn't. It doesn't just get smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually disappear. It changes in strength and stiffness as well at the same time. Okay, that'll do for today. See you next time.